Hey friends, welcome back. I am so excited to have Paige Weber back here on the YouTube with me. And uh, she's an artist. She's she's a friend who I met through YouTube. And we were just talking prior to hitting the record button about how uh, that you shouldn't be fearful if you see someone on YouTube. Most of us are real people, right? Just, yeah. just find their email Shoot them an email, see what's up, especially people, uh, you know, if, if they have a million subscribers, they're probably not going to answer you. But for the rest of us out there that have lower subscriber counts that are trying to put some stuff and positivity in the world, uh, you know, reach out, make some connections with people. I think I think you'd be surprised what you can get because that's how Paige and I met. And now we're friends and we talk probably once a month and I learned so much from her. So Paige, thank you so much for taking the time. And same here. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks for inviting me back. It's always a joy to talk with you. So you're too. You're always hanging out today. Absolutely, it's great. It's great. Um, so today, uh, friends, I wanted to um, uh, just talk to Paige a little bit about her journey through sobriety or being alcohol free. Uh, that's something that you, if you're around my channel, I talk a little bit about smartphones sometimes, but I'm also have a passion of helping people, um, kind of, kind of move on from using alcohol as a, uh, as, as a, as a coping mechanism or a numbing agent or, or, or it's most of the time it's not serving them. Uh, and, and, you know, Paige and I got together and started chit-chatting because of smartphone. She's a light phone user, but then I come to find that she's also had a sobriety journey. So today we're going to focus on that. And and Paige, I'm just going to kind of start from there of like uh, where where you where do you want to start your telling us your journey with alcohol? Kind of like uh, uh, where did where did you first have that awareness that hey maybe maybe this is something I want to address in my life. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I'd love to talk about it. Um, you know, I'm a Gen Xer, so, uh, and I had a very strict mother, so what we did for fun was we'd get together and party when I was old enough to do that, right? And you never really think about how that might not be a good option in your life, necessarily. So then you kind of wind up in your 40s and you're going maybe this isn't really serving me anymore. I don't know how to get out of it, but I know I want to change. And that's kind of how my journey started. I, it was probably around 2016. It was after I'd gotten married. Uh, and I just found that I was really foggy brained. Like we'd, you know, as part of our social network, it was kind of all through my husband's Job and that required. I mean, we were out drinking with other coworkers and having fun and doing activities, and there's certainly nothing wrong with that. But I found that it was really affecting me. Right? Like I, I hadn't noticed it up until that point, and then I'm kind of foggy-headed, but I cannot figure out how to get sober in a situation where my spouse wasn't a sober person. We were in social situations where we were drinking uh, and I just didn't know how to na navigate it so mm -hmm. uh, I thought well maybe I can just start going to AA meetings because I've had plenty of friends that were in AA I've even gone to AA meetings in support of them to kind of understand what that's like a little bit uh, and had some friends go through that program and it was life-saving for at least one of my really good friends um, and I thought, well, maybe I can just start going to AA. I don't know what to do. I don't know that I am an alcoholic. Uh, one of my girlfriends who actually, uh, I, you know, she's the one that I felt like the program really saved her. You know, she says, Paige, I don't think that you're an alcoholic because you can stop at a couple drinks. And, you know, whereas I can't, it's like I have one and then I've gone off the rails, basically. Her life has kind of gone off the rails and so I you know you're kind of in this interim you're like well am I am I not like I don't want to do this anymore so how do I navigate that so I just kind of stopped drinking right because I'm like this isn't serving me anymore I feel better when I'm not I'm not worried about if I'm being embarrassing or loud or you know, obnoxious, you know, because that's what I always would worry about the next day. I'm like, oh, 
you know, was I obnoxious and loud? I mean, because, you know, you're uninhibited. Yeah. And so, um, and then I started kind of having health issues, too, around the same time. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I didn't do anything about getting sober at that time. My husband was still drinking and still socializing in this way with his coworkers and things. So, you know, you're, you're going and you're having a drink or two. But what I noticed was I was getting really sick every time I would drink beer. And that's kind of what I wound up um, drinking most was beer. So I could have a couple of beers and not be in- inebriated, per se. Yeah, too loopy or anything. Mm-hmm. But I'd be violently ill. And mm. so I, I was just like, I think I have to quit drinking. And I... Honestly, my husband, he can do whatever he wants if he wants to drink. I can, I'm can. i going to have to be able to navigate social situations in, for my own health and not do it. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what I did, uh, it was that I just kind of stopped drinking. I think the last time I intentionally drank was in 2019. Mm-hmm. I'd met with a sorority sister at that time. I was still trying to navigate those weird waters of socializing with people who drink Mm -hmm. Um, because all of my socializing up to that point would be like, hey, let's go to the brewery or hey, let's, you know, it kind of, I think, especially American culture, it it kind of um, surrounds a drinking culture. Absolutely. Absolutely. We ce- we celebrate birthdays, anniversaries, business meetings. Uh, we have a good we have a good day. Let's let's go get let's go get drinks. It's pretty much it's pretty mm-hmm. much it's it's sporting events. It's uh, it's everything basically. That's mm-hmm. that's 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 what you see on TV if, if people watch TV anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's kind of like smoking. You know, you'd see smoking on TV for yes. years. And then now it's drinking, right? I think it's alcohol is a weird one because it's socially acceptable and it's legal, but it's really can be very deadly for people. Yes, yes, absolutely. It 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 uh, it does a lot of damage not only to to health and 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 I think the sneaky thing about alcohol it's a very it's very progressive. So. When you first encounter the substance or start using it, you don't really notice any any change. But it's a it's a slow it's a slow. But you start building tolerance. We we have the capacity to build tolerance to all types of uh, food or or a lot of a lot of different environments, not just uh, alcohol or, or food food and drink. It's like uh, light or uh, we, we adapt, right? That's mm-hmm. what we are as humans. And 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 as those changes start to happen, we then we, as we build tolerance. We need more of the substance, so then you start having to drink more, and then that that just compounds the that the more volume going through your body. Uh, your body's got to process this poison, and it it uh, it takes a toll. It takes mm-hmm. a toll. It does, especially because then you have the age. We're aging. We're using more. Mm-hmm. Not a, not a good combo, right? Well, and you're thinking too, like now I'm really tuned into kind of brain health, right? Mm-hmm. So how is this affecting my brain? aging you know and cognitive ability because that's yes. i think now that's more important to me now than anything actually <laughs> you if know. you uh did you uh if this is too personal just let me know but when you had your health scare was it was it was it brain related or or mental related uh in some way no okay but um you know i i feel like it really like i talked about that foggy uh-huh. stuff um, when I quit drinking, that helped. And then when I kind of got rid of the smartphone, that really helped, that distractedness. So I, I think it's all tied together. Honestly, I b- believe that, um, well, I know that I have a gluten intolerance of some sort. Yeah, especially if you're drinking beer. Ugh. Yeah, oh yeah, and those micro brews, you know. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I didn't know if you were drinking good beer. I mean, and those things are 300, a good pale ale IPA. I don't know if you're an IPA drinker or whatever, but those are three, 300 calories a pop, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, man. You have a yeah. couple of those and yeah. So they, they have, uh, I, 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 going back to the cognitive issues, something that I'm, I'm more heightened as I'm aging is that uh, Alzheimer's is, is in my family and I was uh, – 
I, I ran my genetic test to see if I had the APOE4 gene, which is a pre, uh, it's, you know, not to get all into the weeds, but basically you can have two aeles, a, a, I can't see the word, but there's, there's two chromosomes to that, you know, whether you have a matching APOE4 and an APOE4 or one four and one three or, or, you know, whatever the case is. But basically mm-hmm. if you have one, you're 33% tri- higher chance of potentially having Alzheimer's. If you have two, you're 66% chance higher. I have one. And, and alcohol, definitely, uh, that wasn't the reason why I stopped. But now that I'm on the other side of it, I'm like, okay, this is good. Um, mm-hmm. Because I'm not contributing. The hope is that I don't, you don't turn on that gene, right? And and, right. and, uh, and you can Google up the what kills people these days. And it's heart disease, diabetes, Alzheimer's, basically, one, two, and three. I don't know if they're in that order, but they're, they're mm-hmm. all up in that grouping, are they not? Yeah, I believe so. <clears throat> And, I mean, you know, there's a correlation between gluten and Alzheimer's, and why not give yourself an opportunity to have a better aging, you know, by abstaining, I guess, is my thinking. So, you're not losing out. Let's let's dig into a little bit about, uh, I'm curious, like, you're like, okay, hey, so it's not serving me, brain fog, Mm -hmm. all of that I can relate to. And then it's just like, okay, boom, I, you know, uh, we're, and I'm, I'm going to come back to the 2019 drink socially again. That, that's still okay. on my list here. But let's talk, you, you made it sound, to me, you made it sound like you're just like, like you flipped a light switch. Like, hey, you know, I had this realization that, that it's not serving me. Uh, I want to make a change. Yes, there's going to be some things to navigate. But you know what? Flip. Let's just – just like popping out the SIM card and putting it into a different phone. Let's just try it on and see what happens. Was it, was it really that easy for you when you, when you, uh, when you, made, the, when you made the change? T- talk a little bit more about the nuts and bolts of like mentally making the change and then actually in the day-to-day grind of how that right. actually unfolded for you. So it's, it's very similar to like for me the smartphone versus the dumb phone, right? It's something I thought about for a couple years before, and I would attempt to do it, and then we'd fall off of, you know, I'd be drinking beer, and I'd be like, well, you know, I can do this socially. Um, I can choose when I want to drink and whatever, uh, but then you just kind of wind up drinking beer because I really like to drink beer, you know, I like beer. Mm -hmm. And I enjoy, you know, it kind of loosens me up a little bit. I'm a little bit more gregarious probably uh and so it wasn't necessarily just an easy flip of the switch you know they're they're especially as sick as it made me because i kept doing it you know and every time even if i just had a couple beers i would be very ill and during all of this you know i'm going to the doctor trying to figure out what's going on with me they're doing tests you know they're doing i'm having surgeries you know in the Hmm. They still aren't getting to an answer, and I'm still imbibing in alcohol and that lifestyle and not understanding that maybe they're combined until I think, oh, I don't know, I had one really um, bad episode, and I'm just like, I think it's tied to alcohol. I think I have to give it up because, and these aren't just like, these are kind of scary episodes Mm-hmm. which I will spare you the too much information. But sure, it's, sure. You know, at the end of one of these episodes, they last for for hours, like five hours, you know, and by the end of it, I'm fighting for consciousness, and I'm very ill, I'm dehydrated, and, you know, it's kind of a mystery to all my doctors. And mm-hmm. you think, how many times am I going to go through this before I go give up alcohol? Because this isn't worth it. I mean, what happens if you do lose consciousness in one of these moments? Like, what happens? Do you die? Do you have a heart attack? I mean, I don't know. What You know, nobody else can tell me what's going on. And so yes. finally, you know, I think to, to roll it back to that 2019 um I had tried, I kind of quit drinking before that time. I mean, I maybe, I don't even, I couldn't even tell you how long because I wasn't, you know, I was just trying to quit drinking before that. So I wouldn't imbibe or drink beer uh, when we went out. But like in that instance, I couldn't say no to her. Like, 
I couldn't just say, you know, I'm sober. Can we meet for coffee? Mm-hmm. You know, I, I had to. I'm like, okay, well, this one time, you know, this one time I can have beers or whatever. And, you know, I didn't. It, it was okay. We had a good time. I handled myself okay. But even still, I'm like, I have to learn to navigate that discomfort because yeah. it's for my own life that I I have to do this for myself. I can't, no, nobody else can have any bearing on this for me. I have to tell people hmm. that I'm sober or whatever. Yeah. So before the 29 incident, would you, would you self apply the label sober or alcohol free or anything? Were you, were you thinking yourself in that context prior to that? Or was that kind of an inflection point where you're like, I need to really own this label so that mm-hmm. I can tell people like, like where, how, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I think, Yes, I would say so. It's definitely a label that I live with now that I'm alcohol free. And I don't even, you know, it doesn't even actually have to come up in conversation. But before that, I was trying, you know, it's that trying word that's Mm -hmm. like, it's, you either are or you're not. Yeah. (laughs) So I was trying to, but I probably, I wasn't labeling myself that way at that time. I'm sure, you know, I was just trying it on to see if it, you know, if it fit, so to speak. Yeah, it's funny. It's funny because it took me two years. So I had a sort of similar uh, twenty six. It's funny because twenty sixteen was my year that I started thinking. Okay, I got to do. So I grew up in South Louisiana, party central. Went to LSU, mm-hmm. big party school. Drank all the time. It was it was a badge of honor. Like mm-hmm. of, of uh, you know, can you hang? Can you hang and drink with us? You know, can you stay up late? All the all that. And as I got older. I realized as I went out of the out into the world that I overdrank more than everyone else. Like I, everyone else was still like, "Hey, let's party," but when people would start tapering off, I wanted to keep it going. I was one of those guys, uh-huh. and I could hide it. You know, I I knew. You know, it's like I got my stripes. I can hang out with the zebras. I can get in the mix and be okay. And 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 I I could hide it well, but I felt like that I was like. Like it was a it was a little bit more in me than than I than I liked early, and, mm-hmm. and I'm not in their head. Maybe other people are feeling that way, and I'm and they don't see it. And I don't, you know, who knows? You know, it's it's mm-hmm. it's it's it's, it's, a, it's a slippery slope. But I knew in myself. I'm like this thing's got more more zest, and there was that little voice in my head when I would try to uh, to stop that. It was just like you know the tomorrow voice, you know. You got this. Are you really? Because there's always a party, a wedding, an event, or a friend in town. There's never a good time to give up. There's never a good time to go on a diet. There's never a good time to give up (laughs) your smartphone. And there's never a good time to stop drinking. There's just never. There you can always find something. And so, um, but then, but then to get to the point that I'm trying to make is that 2018 was where. I pr- I was I started what I now call practicing my sobriety. I was like, okay, I got to go 30 days. I got to go 20 days, and um, I would really consider myself a failure during all those. It took me two years from the time where I where I now look back five years late, four and a half years later, mm-hmm. where my last drink was, where that date is. But it took me two years in that process, uh, you know, of, of struggling to get to that date, and I felt horrible for those two years because uh, in the sense that I would I, I would I, sometimes I'd have six months of sobriety and I was like oh I totally got this I can do whatever and I'd have that for, I'd have a couple of beers and um, yeah and nothing would change the next day but within a month I was right back and I would and, and for me the big aha moment to really push me over the ledge was that I journal a lot I like to write write my journal and I would and I would I would I wrote a journal entry one time and thinking it was so fresh, I was like, okay, why, man, I'm right here. What's going on with this? And I started looking through my journals, and I found a journal entry uh, a year prior that was the exact – I was saying the exact same thing to myself. Like it was just like I could have wrote that journal entry a, a, a year ago. I'm writing it again today. I'm like, wow, wow. I'm stuck in the mud. I'm right back to, I'm right back there. Now, the difference was I had all that – those journals and this history, so it wasn't like I was at square – people like to – like in the moment, I'm shaming and blaming myself, which I shouldn't mm-hmm. have. But I'm back to like, oh, I'm back. I failed. I'm back to square one. But not really, because I had all those little breadcrumbs and all that learning. And um, and so my point is that even at six months sobriety, uh, I still never applied the label. Oh, I'm sober. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm not saying I should have. I'm just saying I didn't. Like it took me a while, like almost a year, before I stepped in and, and was able to say, hey, yeah, I'm I'm sober and proud mm-hmm. of it for that matter. Right. Um, Right, and so I, I can totally identify. I don't know if I made any point there, but uh, 
You did. My, my, my first point is while you're trying in your sobriety, if you're if you're watching this and you're listening to Paige and I, even if you're trying and you're failing some, as long as you're trying, you're not you're not all of that trying is not for not for lost. It's not it's not just throw away. Oh, you're a failure. You're never going to get it done. You're learning. You're trying to figure this out. Keep mm-hmm. it going. And number two, don't worry about the label. Am I an alcoholic? Am I sober? Am I this? Go after the feeling. Paige is making an excellent point. It's like, how do you feel? Wow, because that was something else that I I launched, grabbed onto was, I feel better when I don't drink. Mm-hmm. And, and I didn't really think, like, I didn't want to drink initially for, like, I didn't want to be an asshole or, or say something stupid or I know it's not good for my health. But what really got me over the edge was not drinking for 30 days and going, wow, I feel amazing. Like, I want to feel like, I actually feel, and I think I wrote that down in one of my journals one time, was that I actually like the Greer who is a non-drinker, who is, I like the way I feel better, I like who I am, I like the way I, you know, all of these things. I like myself over here more than I like the drinking. And that was the tipping point for me, you know? Right. Yeah. I mean, that's awesome. Because that's what you want. And I think when you have time under your belt... You really do feel that. And you, you're you like, I really feel like myself. I'm embracing who I am. Um, I'm not trying to be anybody else. Um, I just like this person a lot better, and I feel good. Absolutely. <clears throat> Absolutely. So uh, after that 2019 event, that was, that was, that was your, your, like, uh, that's when that's that was your I don't want to say turning point because it, you'd already it sounded like you already had so did you was it that hard after the after that social event for you to rein yourself back in were you were you were you aware that that did, did it did it did it fire you up to have more beer or was it really like nope I'm turning this off like a faucet and that was it nope it was really that point where I was like you're gonna have to learn how to navigate this without drinking because mm-hmm. I don't want to be drinking. So you're going to have to figure out how to tell people that you you don't imbibe. Or if you don't, then you go and you drink nothing that's alcoholic. And you just enjoy the space without making it weird for them. Mm-hmm. But knowing where your boundaries are. Yeah. And so <clears throat> now I've actually had a couple of weird events since then, actually, that I do want to talk about because I think it sure. could be helpful for somebody. But at that time... I just knew, regardless of what's happening, I have to make this choice for myself. So if you feel like you've derailed yourself because you've drank, tomorrow is a new day. Pick it up. You you have all of this experience, like you said, of feeling really good. You can just carry that on with you and not make yourself feel guilty for uh, what you might deem as feeling or, you know, I drink a beer or whatever I think we get really tied up into that and that can derail us more so so I'll give you a couple of examples since then because then now I just don't drink um, and it's a non-issue and I really don't envision myself drinking because it's not part of my social life anymore and I have so much time under my belt of being feeling good and, and not doing it that I just am not interested in doing it but Mm -hmm. there have been a couple times actually in the last couple years i would say where somebody's handed me a drink in a social setting and i didn't realize that it was alcohol like uh, (laughs) one was during a christmas show and it was like a little shot glass of what i thought was like apple cider and so I drank it because I was like, oh, it's, you know, it's a holiday. It's apple cider. All of the vendors that were at this particular art show were getting it. You know, I'm like, okay, you know. And then I, you know, I took a drink and I'm like, this is alcohol. Like, I, I don't want to be drinking any of this stuff, you know. So, mm-hmm. you know, I've had two, two different occasions just like that art-related things where somebody hands you something. You're like, oh, it's apple sparkling apple whatever and then you drink it and you're like okay so you can choose not to drink that and put that down or you you know you take the shot of cider and you go no more yeah Yeah. so you know sometimes those things are going to happen but that doesn't mean it has to derail you and you know 
Um, interestingly enough, so my husband, he was on the road working um, in construction, and he drank a lot on the road because he was alone and bored and it was kind of a social thing um i think he was lonely and when he came home he decided not to drink anymore too wow i didn't know that which, yeah which was really surprising to me because i i knew that for me my journey had to be my own um he couldn't i, I couldn't I had to make that decision for myself yeah. and the same would go for him. Like if he chose to do that, that was okay if he drank or not, but he had to do it for himself and he has done it as well. And, you know, he's probably, he'd probably not appreciate me saying this, but you know, I think he'd probably be more apt to drink, you know, to be a drinker. And he, he hasn't regretted quitting drinking either. And I think since we're a united front and we just don't, we don't really think about it because we don't do it, uh, but we also are a united front and that we're just not going to go there. Yeah, especially when you have health issues and things like that. And I was going to say that I think the part that I would, I would help communicate to people if someone's thinking about going stopping drinking or just even taking a break for a while you 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 it's hard to imagine how much you stop caring about alcohol maybe 6 9 it's hard to know where that where, you know all these date counting things it's like it, it it's kind of helpful for a while because you need something to kind of keep you going but at some point you just stop caring and it's like mm-hmm. you never think about it it's like it's like if you've never smoked cigarettes and you walk by the cigarette aisle. You don't even. It's like you don't even acknowledge that. It's you just. You just don't even care, right? I, at least that's how mm-hmm. I feel. Um, that's how I like, feel too. Yeah, it's just like I never. I never. You know, you, you don't play any of those games of like, okay, well, if I just have one, should I do a light beer instead of that beer? Can I have this? What are the, you know, like all that little rigmarole just says. It's just. It just. Mm-hmm. It's just irrelevant. And I. I had a similar experience with the shot. I was at a wedding. Vicky and I were there. She, my wife still drinks. She she drinks vodka soda, and I had a Topo Chico, which is basically sparkling. We both had a lime, you know. So she's got like a vodka tonic with a lime. I've got a Topo Chico with a lime, and they're in red cups, you know, the whole solo cup. Mm-hmm. And I grabbed the wrong cup, and I cause we just got off the dance floor. And I took a big old gulp, and I spit it back. I I didn't consume it because I had it, it startled me so much, and I spit it yeah. back. But I, I promise you, I had a buzz for about a split second just from the alcohol <laughs> being in my mouth. And I, you know, I put it down. I went on about my way. I didn't reset my date. I wasn't like, oh, my God, I broke. Yeah. Or I was, you know, I just was like, where's my water? And mm-hmm. um, I think that's what it's got to be. It's like uh, I've run across people who, who are so into other people's sobriety. It's like this is my journey. And, you know, if that happened to me uh, – if I have if I have work to do and, and it put me on a bender, okay, so be it. I'll I'll deal with that work. But it didn't do anything for me. I was three mm-hmm. three three years into sobriety at that point. I mean, it was like a non-issue for me. I only bring it up from time to time to share stories, maybe to help someone else. But I don't really view it as a as an event, if you will. Right. Right. Probably much like you do with the little shot of apple cider. It was just like unintentional and. You know what really went through my head when I reflect on it? I'm curious, like whatever it was that I used to think was there to help me or whatever was in alcohol, like when it, having that back in my, that one sip that I didn't even swallow, I sound like I'm Bill Clinton. I didn't inhale, but uh, <laughs> if you know who Bill Clinton is, <laughs> some people might, some kids who were born, can you imagine there's kids that are 20 some years old who, who were born post Bill Clinton? But anyway, I digress. Oh. Uh, uh, that that uh, I, lo- I lost my I lost my point trying to be funny, but uh, is that 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 it wasn't there? Like in other words, whatever I, I used to think was an alcohol, like oh, it's going to make me funny, it's going to make me more fun, it's going to like I realized whatever whatever I thought was that alcohol did for me, like that one step, I'm like there, there's nothing there, there's nothing there for mm-hmm. me. Whatever I was looking for is not there. Yeah. I yeah, and, and I would say that too. I mean, I think you probably get to a point where you are really comfortable with who you yeah. are. Yeah. And um, 
I think drinking is just that uh, thing that we think is a crutch to help us, but it's really not. And once you've been sober for long enough or, you know, you're not imbibing anymore, you, you don't really feel like you need it. I feel like. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, let's go back. You had a couple of things you were going to share. One was the, one was the apple cider shot. Do you remember what the other couple were? Do you still have those in your head to share with us? Oh, I think the other one was the like the sparkling. What I thought was some kind of sparkling, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, that I had that was like a champagne something with juice or something. I don't know what it was, but yeah. um, I think I just want would want people to know if you're starting this journey or you're considering it, you can navigate it. Mm -hmm. Um, You you will find. I mean, and maybe you have to pair it with something that is healthy like a healthy activity, like maybe you start drinking tea or something, and you maybe uh, become a connoisseur of tea or something that's a little healthier that you enjoy, that you can partake in, that gives you some joy. I don't know. I, 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 I did not become a connoisseur, but that was the the little trick of the mind that I used as well when I when a happy hour would come I or I had that craving uh, cravings are always a big deal when I when I help people and I and I'm talking with people that are trying to overcome this they're like you know how do I deal with cravings right and and the the honest answer is there is no solution it's they're 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 there and you have to kind of navigate through them and eventually they won't be there but if you mm-hmm. keep giving into the cravings, then they they they're going to remain, right? And it's yeah. it's it's like you've got to get, it's like you got to go through a little bit of pain, and then they're gone. Uh, yeah. And that little bit of pain, I mean, to be honest, it could be it could be a month, it could be could be a month and a half. It might only be two mm-hmm. weeks. Different people, different, you know. But it, there's going to be there's going to be some there. But my my point was, I would turn on the kettle. Make a cup of tea and I'd sit on the pad. There's a certain chair I like on my little patio. I sit on my patio and I'd work a Sudoku. And I was like, "This will pass." And I and mm-hmm. or, or I would st- I would stare at the the wall on my patio, and and uh, and I was just like, I just got to get to you know when the cravings would come on hard, I would just be like, all I got to do is just I've got two hours. You know what? And if I don't have two hours, I'm going to go to bed early. Mm-hmm. And then over time, I would start the kettle and I'd go on about my business, and the kettle would go off. And I was like, oh, yeah, I was going to make a cup of tea. And I'd never make the tea. I'd just turn off the kettle and go on about my business. But that, I, <laughs> yeah. I use that, that kettle as my little Pavlov dog of, like, turn on the kettle. Craving hits, turn on the kettle. And, mm-hmm. and, and eventually it, it, the cravings got weaker and where I don't even use the kettle anymore. You know, I don't right. drink as much. I still enjoy a tea. But, um, and so that, there's, a, there's a process there, unfortunately. Um, there's this. Y- yeah. And it's that uncomfortable, like you say, it's that uncomfortable part where yes. you're really susceptible. Yeah. My my experience has been, Paige, I'm kind of curious, on the, let's stick with cravings just for, for a minute, that there are two critical junctures with cravings. There is... They, they, so just like I described, cravings, when you stop, they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna peak. There's a, there's a paramount moment where they're the worst possible and then they're going to get easier and if you if you don't give in to them then they're going to subside and start getting a little easier and a little easier and easier and, and it's going to be a curve you know kind of like a bell curve but then it's going to get down to close to zero uh most people give in at the peak oh my god this craving is so bad mm-hmm. and and the mental thing that you do is you basically say f it i'm giving in i'll start tomorrow what you know you just you just basically throw it in right there's no fooling you you consciously know I shouldn't do this, but I'm doing it anyway because the cravings are so bad. Right. That's a hard one. I don't really have a solution for that other than you've got to you, – one, one of the times, if you want to get to the other, you're, you're going to have to get through that. The second one, though, I think is the more dangerous one, and that is as you're on the way down, that little voice in your head starts talking to you and say, hey, you totally got this. Look, alcohol is not a problem in your life. You thought it was, but it, it, you're fine. You're not, you're not like those people. You're normal. You can handle this, blah, blah, blah. And you're over all those cravings. You've done all that work. The cravings aren't even that bad. And you yeah. just, you have hubris basically is what I, you know, I kind of call it of like, yeah, I can't have that drink. And you do. And, and then you, you get confirmation. You're like, yeah, see, I'm totally fine. And then in a month, you're right back where you were again. 
And right. unfortunately, then the problem is that when you go back, those cravings, you got to climb the hill of the cravings again, right? Um, mm-hmm. uh, and that's that's where. But those are the two. Those are the two that I that I find, right? I would also say that you would have to experience your own personal self abuse and shame the second time around. Mm. Right. So you're also against yourself because you're like, I really screwed up, you know. So I, th- I think it's kind of like a, a passing breeze. You just have to say, today's a new day. Mm-hmm. I'm going to tough it out because I know on the other side, there is like an oasis on the other side, Nirvana or what have you. I'm going to feel good and I'm just going to let this pass me by. I'm going to have some discomfort, but I'm not going to beat myself up. I'm going to be successful. And, and, you know, even I think, I can't remember if it's um, Atomic Habits or a different book where they talk about, I mean, you can say to yourself, I'm a non-smoker, I'm a non-drinker, or I'm trying to become a non-drinker, or I'm trying to become... So if you have this affirmative voice where you're saying, I'm a non-drinker, and you repeatedly tell yourself this, it does something to your brain, and it will help you see yourself, envision yourself in this sober mode, in this, I don't smoke anymore, I don't don't drink anymore, whatever it is, I can do this. Yeah, that's Set atomic yourself habits. Up for, mm-hmm. okay, set yourself so up for. So set yourself up for success and be kind to yourself. He talks about that in that section of atomic habits you're mentioning. Uh, is uh, true habit change happens when you when you put on the new identity. So at some point, that's what we we're kind of talking about with that label. You know, labels are are. They're a tricky thing. They're sometimes good and sometimes not good. But if you are can 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 see yourself with that label of like, yes, I don't drink, like, and I'm okay with that, and you mm-hmm. can really be okay with that, then it's going to be a heck of a lot easier, you know, uh, to to move forward in that world, right? Oh, I I, I go to I'm a I'm the type of person that goes to the gym. Yeah, I work out. I, I I'm a, I'm I'm pretty athletic, or I am athletic, or whatever the word mm-hmm. is you want to use. Um, or I, I'm a jogger or whatever. And if you see yourself, just like, basically I'm repeating what you just said. Uh, mm-hmm. But if you can own that identity, um, you know, the hard part is is uh, we all have the imposter syndrome, right? I'm kind of curious uh, on that. When you, uh, this is a little bit off the beaten path of, al- you know, the, the, the alcohol talk, but you're an artist, right? And you're out there mm-hmm. on your own doing your thing. Uh you know, there has to be a point like when you when you take on that label, I, I'm now s- sober or alcohol free, or I am now an artist. I mean, uh, any thoughts on that? I mean, I, it had to be somewhat of a of a a brave moment for you to step out and be like, yes, I'm an artist. This is what I do. Mm-hmm. Look at my art world, right? Sure. I mean, even though I went to school to right? become a, you know, I have. A, a minor in painting, and, and I'm a designer, and I have a master's degree. But when I was a, an, when I had gone through undergrad, even though I had a degree, I still couldn't call myself an artist because it's that I don't know what it is. It's just, and I think almost artists are probably worse than anybody about this. Um, but I did a 365 day project where I did a painting a day for a year. And at that point, when I did that Hmm. project, I was doing it every day. I then could hold my head up high and say, I am an artist. I love it. But the truth is, even today, you know, we had kind of, I kind of alluded to this. Um, As an artist and as a painter, you know, you apply for shows, you apply for grants, you are always putting yourself out there. And just like YouTube or social media or whatever, maybe you'll get traction, maybe you don't. I, just recently I applied to a show that's pretty lucrative in my genre. And I yeah. didn't get into either of the shows that were part of the show. Hmm. And for a moment, you know, there's just a couple moments you entertain that whole thought of, ah, maybe my work's not good enough. 
you know, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? Am I ever going to, is it ever going to get me better? Am I ever going to get into a show? And I only allow myself to think that for a couple minutes. I'm only going to let myself feel sorry for a couple moments. Because the truth is, everything is circumstantial. I am, you know, I'm up against a lot of other people who are all passionate about painting too. And maybe I'm a newbie and they're going to take people who have been in the show before. Or the jury is a different kind of jury than they were last year and they're looking for something specific this year. You're only really as good as what you're up against, kind of. But if you let it defeat you, then it you'll never never know how where you're going to take your work or to your sobriety or whatever. I mean, I think half of success is being curious as to seeing what's on the other side. I'd like to allow allow yourself to be curious about like who am I going to be? That sober version of myself, or that artistic version of myself that puts themselves out there and who takes the leap. You know, uh, big things can be right around the corner, but if you quit, you're never going to get there. I love it. I love it because there's so much of, of shame and, and, and beating yourself up. And uh, at least in this, and, and most people's sobriety journey, because they're like, it's, it's hard. It is so hard. Mm-hmm. Uh, and most people are, uh, if you if you're sitting out there and you're even thinking about trying this, you should even even this part before you even have one day of sobriety underneath your belt. Uh, that's a huge step right there. Just being like, mm-hmm. you know, I, I like to say, uh, uh, you know, uh, it start you've got you've got to tell yourself the truth, right? Uh, I don't really view it in, in the moment of like, oh, I'm surrendering or anything like that. It's just like, just tell yourself the truth. Like if you know it's mm-hmm. a problem, you know, and, it, and a problem is such a bad word. If it's an issue, concern, whatever word you want to use, it doesn't have to be like this. Uh, just start telling yourself the truth and, and, and get curious, like Paige said, because I think, I think Paige is an amazing word because it's not about, oh, I failed or I didn't do this or I had a beer or... You, you, when, once you open this up and you start thinking about it, just make a promise to yourself not that you're not going to drink. That's not that's not the the initial thing you should be doing. You should be like, I'm going to be I'm going to get really curious about how all of this is working and how it's making impacting my life, and I'm going to tell myself the truth. Mm-hmm. If you do those two things, that's going to start letting things unfold, and you're going to start seeing things differently. And then you might get to a point where you can say, you know what? I'm going to take a little break. I'm not going to drink in this situation or that situation, mm-hmm. or maybe I'm going to go a month or, or whatever. But um, it, it, I liken it to weight loss, uh, some page. You know, I, I, mm-hmm. I've uh, still on my journey, but I, I've lost about 70 pounds from my from my heaviest. And Congratulations. I always tell my, well, thank you. It's been many years in the making, um, but I'm like I always tell myself I didn't I didn't gain 100 pounds in a week, and I'm certainly not going to lose 100 pounds in a week, right? And it's like you didn't uh, become alcohol did not become this large in your life with one drink, and you know, and it's not like you're just going to flip a switch and it's going to be done. You, you, there's some work you got to do, right? You got to. But the main thing is going back to the curiosity that I think you said, which is point number one. Telling yourself the truth and showing up for yourself. Just show mm-hmm. up for yourself. Uh, you yeah. can get so much done with those those three tools right there. Right, and you know, kind of in in regards to like weight loss or anything like that, it's that compound effect. You know, it's like one day at a time. You know, and yep. you've heard that in other programs, but it's true. It's like you said, it's a slope. It's like a marathon. Uh, not a sprint, and mm-hmm. it's very doable. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's just basically you just have to worry about now. Very, very Zen concept, mm-hmm. you know, of of, uh, um, of living in the moment, which is is, is it's so hard for us humans because we 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 have the. Uh, I was listening to someone give a talk about this about how we have. Uh, it was Stephen Hayes. He, he's a psychologist that did the act uh, acceptance and acceptance and commitment therapy. I don't know if you've heard of ACT before. Mm-hmm. Uh, I but I was just, yeah, it, it's, it's, he, he has a book called The Liberated Mind. And uh, he talks about, uh, you know, we have this chatter in our head so much. 
uh, we all do, right? We all think it's just us, but we have mm-hmm. this voice that's just telling us to do things through this. And we have this ability as humans from a very, very young age, she was saying, to be able to say, huh, like, let's go with, with, with smartphones or for whatever. I'm thinking about using that dumb phone over there. But what am I going to do about maps? What am I going to do about this? How am I going to get my contacts in there? Like, we can play these scenarios. Is it going to be easier, though? Like, I think it is. I'll get this benefit, but not that benefit. He's like, he's like from, a, from, the, from like a child, uh, very, very young, maybe not that sophisticated, but we can start trying to problem solve, essentially, in our brain. <laughs> without actually having to do the experiment, right, in real life. Like, let me try this. And mm-hmm. uh, and that just, that leads to a place where we are living in our head too much and, and paralysis, basically. Mm-hmm. And I think that can happen right. with weight loss, sobriety, all of these things. We're like, oh, well, what about this? And what are they going to say here? And if I show up, and da, 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 and, and then they offer me a beer. Well, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, it's like, that didn't happen. Let's just go see what's going to happen, mm-hmm. right? And... Right. Um, Anyway, I, I'm, I'm on a, I'm on a tangent with that, but uh, you've got you've got to you. What he talks about basically his solution for that chatter. That's the part I was trying to get to is, um, is he he he's he's a proponent of giving it a name. He calls his George, his brain, his chatter brain, and he and he's like George. This is not an issue yet. If it becomes an issue, I will I, I will deal with it. Or George. You know, I've done, we've, we've handled this before. We can handle it again. It's going to be okay. And he's also mm-hmm. a proponent of, as you and I talk about uh, before our, our index cards. He's mm-hmm. like, if you if you tell yourself you suck or you you, you know whatever the, whatever the negativity is, he's like, write it on the card and put it in your pocket. And when that when that when that voice comes up that says, oh, you're just going to drink again. Why don't you just go ahead and start drinking? You just touch the card and be like, you know what? I've thought this before. This is not the first time I've had this thought. I know what I know that that's not true, and I'm okay with that. And I know what yeah. to do with that, you know, kind of thing. I know. It, I, it, it's, I a corny, love that. it's a corny exercise. It's a corny exercise, but I think that having it externalized on a card so that mm-hmm. you don't feel like it's the first time. That's the thing. It's those lies that your mind's telling you to protect mm-hmm. you, uh, and you think you've never heard it. And you're like, oh, I'm gonna solve this puzzle. No, you don't. No, you don't. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, and I think it also makes you aware, right, of how many times you have this negative voice with yourself. Yes. Every time you touch that pocket, it makes you aware. It creates an action. And so you're aware of how many times you're like, I'm a failure. I'm a, you know, I'm failing or whatever it is. You can go, that's not true. You know, there's that saying, it's the same thing. Don't believe everything you think. Yes, right. That's and there's right. a lot of truth to both of those things. You know, it's just. I, I love the card idea because I think it just makes us more aware. Yeah, oh, he he's an amazing uh, interview, S- Stephen Hayes. I'll uh, I'll see if I can put a link down below if I can find. He's got several interviews on on YouTube, and it's called The Liberated Mind. He wrote it in 2020, but uh, basically, he his his his. his recommendation for success is to think about the person that that identity non-drinker thin person whatever it is what 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 would that person be like Mm -hmm. write it out and then you just own that persona and you step into it and be like i'm and you just i hate to say pretend because pretend's not maybe the word he used but you act like um my cat, my cat is, is about to walk on my keyboard. Hello, oh, there's there's my kitty cat. Okay, so oh. let's 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 get off the show. Oh, so this sweet. was the little stray black cat that, that showed up a couple years ago. But his, his point is, you step into that persona, and the persona has understands. Uh, all of your trauma, all of your history, all of the bad things, your body, is, if it's out of shape, and it says, okay, what what are we going to do with this? These, these are the bones and the body we got. What, what are we going to do? Well, you know what? We're going to walk every morning at 8 o'clock. We're going to do this. And, and, he, and his point is that persona would probably be a lot more kind and forgiving than you are to yourself, and it's going to say, you know what? You're probably going to eat like this instead of like this, and you're probably not going to have this, and you're going to have this, and this is what we're going to do because we're going to get you in shape. Where you know it's like basically you walk around with your own, you coach yourself in, into it, and um, yeah. and instead of just living off of impulse, and uh, 
and that's that's his that's his solution. It's easier said than done. Um, mm-hmm. Easier said than done. But and and he has this uh, uh, secondary corollary to that is so that that's that's the persona, and uh, and then every four hours you check in with yourself and you op- open up get a sheet of paper and just be like, okay, how did I do these last four hours? Am mm-hmm. I doing what I what I think I should be doing? Kind of thing. I think just that's that a good like, component. Yeah. For that's that it. check-in, that personal check-in. Mm-hmm. Because you'll find, I'm sure, that after a certain amount of time, you're having to check in less. That's correct. And he's and he would suggest that if you can handle four hours of autonomy without going off the rails, being procrastination or surfing YouTube when you should be working or drinking, or he's like shorten it down to two hours. And if two hours is not good, shorten it down to one hour. <clears throat> you know. Yeah, it's kind of like a time blocking. Yes. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. He, he also the the other the, while we're, we're just to wrap that up for someone if they're really interested, I'll, I'll I can I can send you the article if someone's interested. I'll send it to you, Paige. Uh, okay. Is that when you after you reflect for those four hours, then you say, okay, what am I going to do for the next four hours? I'm going to do one, two, and three, or I'm going to focus on this goal or that goal. And it also what it does is it, I think for me when I use this tool and I do use it almost every day, um, it makes me think there's no way I'm going to get all that done in four hours. Like you have this, you're like, oh, I'm going to do all this today, and you never get it done, and you beat yourself up. That's a very bad cycle. It's just like, hey, you know, like when I hang up with you after this call. I'm not. I've got about five things left on my list. I'm not quite sure in my own mind which one I'm going to tackle because I got to check in with the wife first and see what's up. Mm-hmm. But then I'm going to assess that situation. I'm going to be like, I have an hour and a half. What am I going to do next? And then I'm going to decide. And then I'm going to execute. And then I'm going to reflect. And his point is, uh, not only is it for the action part of it, or not. Uh, uh, of like these are what I'm going to do. He's like we tend to we tend to reflect when we should be doing. He's like you reserve reflection to a you you constrain when you reflect, so you have more time to act. So when we're all sitting, uh-huh. we're like, oh, I got to do these things today, and you're like, well, should I do this? Should I use that email program? Should I use my smartphone? Mm-hmm. That's in his mind reflection. He's like, we're not reflecting now. We'll reflect at the designated times, and all you mm-hmm. do is pick up what's in front of you and you start doing. If that is pick up that paintbrush and you start painting, then do that, right? Yeah. It's like stop reflecting, stop ruminating, as he would say, mm-hmm. um, during times of action. You know that's so good. You know, I don't know if you are familiar with Marie Forleo. I I do. I'm aware of her. I have not really overly. Uh, uh, I mean, she's a force to be reckoned, right? You say I see her, but I, I don't. I'm not a consumer of her content, uh, just because. Not for any negative reason. I just this is not in my zone. I guess I've, I've never done it. But right. please share. So she kind of has a similar notion, which actually I just was introduced to like maybe a couple months ago. So this okay. whole idea of you can waste so much time thinking, just like he says, ruminating about these things that you need to do, the list, and and I was spending hours probably doing that kind of stuff or doing like the little stuff. And like she has pointed out in one of her new kind of programs, I guess I would say, is she's like, just get to the meat of what you're doing. So if you're painting, get to the easel first thing in the morning and do that for, you know, four hours or whatever. Then save all that other stuff later because you will have a huge chunk of stuff under your belt that you've accomplished. Mm Mm-hmm. And you will find that you have a lot more time. So I've been kind of doing that, you know, with all these projects that I'm working on right now. Mm -hmm. I just get right on in. And what I find is it serves me so I'm not online. I'm not Mm -hmm. worried about any kind of... I'm not even worried about my dumb phone because I I have to get some stuff done. So I'm hyper-focused on work in those time frames. And it really... I mean, it's basically she's saying kind of the same thing that he's saying is like just get to the heart of what you're you're doing and save this email or whatever for a specific time. Yes. You know, after you accomplish something. Yes. And you'll yes. feel so much better. And I feel like you don't even think about. I'm not worried about checking anything or. Mm-hmm. 
anything else. Like, I think, yeah. I mean, if you had to put this in terms of sobriety, you, you know, I mean, you're focusing on one thing. You're not even thinking about, like, how many days has it been. You're hyper-focused on the thing that's serving you now. That's right. Or that you're that's serving right. now. That's right. That's right. I would agree. I'd agree. The, the, uh, uh, man, that, the, 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 we, we, that we're, we're going to, we're going to go down this whole, I'm going to make a note next time we talk, since we're going to start doing this more frequently, we're going to, yeah. we're going to talk about this whole, that whole thing. Um, but going, going back, let's, let's tie it, tie it back into sobriety. We're coming up on, on an hour and that is, uh, the message of, you know, if you're, if you're sitting there, um, but what, what I want to kind of share is that if you're sitting out there and you are and you're resonating a little bit, like I want to address this, but you're a little bit nervous, you're not sure what what's going, you know, because there, there's there's a lot of as pages point out the social you got to deal with yourself, you got to deal with your spouse, you got to deal with your friends. There's a lot of that going on. Um, uh, God, I, I lost my train of thought, Paige, on that. I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> you're fine. God, I hate when I do that. I sh- that's why I write I write things down in my little cards in front of me. Um, well, it's a process, right? All yeah. of it is a process. And you have to give yourself grace. Yes. You can do it. Um, I'm trying to help you here. <laughs> no, you're doing fine. You're doing fine. Hopefully. You, hopefully. You, you, if you if you have any closing because I, I I it's right there on the tip I know what I want to say but I can't I can't pull it back out but it, it's um, uh, I've already kind of given the process but it's like you know it, it, I was going to say something like you're not alone or oh that's what I was going to say most most of us I think uh, and I think this is really really, really I, I I'm I'm present again I got it most of us. Uh, in this space, when you're thinking about alcohol, want to dismiss it by saying, "Oh, I'm not like this person. I don't have a problem. It's not as bad." You, uh, you're wait, almost like you're waiting for a rock bottom. You're waiting for some event to happen. God forbid something t- terrible to happen. Mm-hmm. So you're like, "Okay, now I've got to change, and I'm going to make some." And, and, and when you do look at a study, not just with alcohol, but you just look at a way when people make these life changes, generally it's because some life event has happened. They have cancer. Something's happened. They get a DUI. There's something tragic that happens, and they're like, "Okay, I'm going to pivot." And it's like, why wait for that? You know, the elevator is going down. Step off at the next floor. Just step off. It, at least don't stop digging. Stop going down because down is only going to get worse. Is my point. So you don't have to start going back up right away. Just the awareness. Basically, step step one is just being aware. Okay, alcohol is in my life. I'm not really sure how big or how small, but there's something with it that I'm not too okay with, and mm-hmm. I need to think about this, right? And and don't don't wait for a life event to address this. Right. If you if you if you if you spend it, if you're 50 minutes into this already, then then you're probably thinking about this. Is my point? Right. Don't wait for a, tra- a tragic event to happen, right? Right. And that's what I'm just trying to say. Just step off. I love that analogy. Where you're giving us that visual of just step off the elevator, just step off where you are. Just, just mm-hmm. take, take cause you, you know, it's not your fault that that alcohol has a grip on you because it's just part of society. But it is our responsibility. It is your responsibility moving forward to do something about it. Like, mm-hmm. like uh, we we all. Uh, and I'm going to say we because this is on YouTube. We all scour YouTube. It's like, oh, hey, what laptop should I buy? How do I fix this? Uh, you know, we, we live in a, a world, unfortunately, of like, if I just buy this thing on Amazon, it's going to fix my problem. Yeah. This is the problem that you just can't buy something on Amazon to fix. You, you're going to have to get your hands dirty. You're going to have to get in the weeds a little bit. And it's going to have to be your thing for a little while to solve it. It doesn't have to be your thing for the rest of your life and be mm-hmm. like, oh, i got to wear this big scarlet letter A yeah. on my – you know, if you if you if you actually went to school and read the books they told you, you know that you know the Scarlet Letter book. Um, you know, you don't have to wear it for all your life, but you might have to wear it for a couple of months and figure it out. Right? That's what I'm trying to say. Right. Could be a year. You know, I don't know. For Paige and I, it was a couple of years. Um, mm-hmm. But it wasn't like Paige. Just to confirm this, it wasn't like two years in the muck. Like you're just face down in the muck. Mm-hmm. It's like it's two years, but it, it got easier as those years went mm-hmm. along. I would assume, right? Oh, absolutely. And you think about it a lot less. Um, 
you know, it's not like you're miserable the whole time. You actually can yes. see the upside. And so I think that's what helps you get back on that train and go, yep, this is sobriety is for me. Because I got one. I got, I, I got, go ahead. I, I interrupt you. No, cause, no, go ahead. So, uh, I was having lunch with a friend. He was like, so you're sober? Like he, he's a loose, like a, like a LinkedIn kind of friend. And he had a couple mm-hmm. of questions for me. I probably see him once every three or four years. Uh, he's a great guy, actually. I, I thought to myself, we should have lunch more often. Um, <laughs> but he, I, I was like, yeah, sobriety keeps getting better and better. And I'm like, there's so many more benefits. And he's like, like what? And he put me on the spot. And I, and, I, and I struggled with a few things of like how it's gotten better. But it's, it's, it's so much more than just not the not drinking part. Like the freedom that I have and the mental, like I don't think about things. I was kind of curious what you would say. Do you think things have gotten like, like where you thought it would be like before you gave up drinking and now that you're really not drinking and you've been years away from it, is it better than what you thought it was going to be? And has, has things gotten, have you seen any benefits the longer that you have not drank? drank? Do you see what I'm saying? Um, yeah, I think I'm, I'm following you there. I think that um, I think you. We always kind of perceive it to be more of a struggle, an ongoing struggle. And it mm-hmm. really, once I kind of made that decision, I've never looked back. So it's yeah. really. It, I think that's really freeing because I also don't think about it. You know, you mm-hmm. think that you're going to be thinking about it all the time, and I just, I don't. I think it becomes easier. Um, there was a second part of that question that I think I lost, but um, well, let me, let me, I'll, I'll, cause I thought of a better way of asking it. So let's say if you stop drinking, you get, uh, uh, I'm going to go with the Olympic, you know, gold, silver, bronze. So you stop drinking and year one goes by and you get a bronze chip, uh, or, 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 or necklace or whatever, uh, medallion. And then year two goes by, you get something that's silver year five goes by, you get a gold one. I'm not talking about like chips for me. I'm just I'm just trying to give you an analogy. And there's more benefits that you wouldn't have got until you hit year five, let's say. And and I and I, I want to believe that that's true. Like I think about like just how I feel in year four of sobriety of like that. I don't think I felt this good even. Like going back to your compound effect. It, do you think there's a compound effect happening that the longer we don't drink? Uh, that we're still getting more benefits, like there's other things unlocking. Like I, th- I think there's things <laughs> the way my brain is wired that are kind of rewiring from that ad- that addiction thing that's healing, basically. Mm-hmm. It's corny. I, don't, I, I can't, I can't uh, rationally and empirically say this is exactly what's happening, but that's how I feel. So I'm kind of mm-hmm. curious. Do you feel that way at all? Or am I leading the witness too much? I'm just, I'm just kind of curious how you feel about it. No, I would agree. I think. Some of the benefits that I have uh, experienced obviously are I'm my gut healing process has been an ongoing process, right? And now that I've mm-hmm. kind of discerned what's the culprit, it even it reaffirms that for me. But also, I think my critical thinking skills are improved. I like that. Um, and I am not fuzzy or foggy or hazy. I think also it kind of touches into who I am just innately. I like to learn and read and it has afforded me also with getting you know away from the smartphone it's given me time to be able to explore that aspect of myself that's innately there. Mm-hmm. That curiosity and that learning and I feel like, especially uh, having let go of the smartphone, you know, the alcohol was the first thing, the smartphone was the second thing, is that now I'm kind of exploring note cards as well and really that process of retaining and thinking and getting stuck in those things that we're interested in or like painting, like really engrossing myself in those things. I, I have this theory about people that we are all the best versions of our 14 year old selves like that's innately who we are like if you were a kid who loved star wars you're probably an adult that loves star wars if you were a kid that was really curious about riding or something that's probably a thing that really is that you something that you love 
And so maybe if we could explore those best versions of ourselves at 14, hopefully we were sober at that time, maybe not. Mm -hmm. But some of those best aspects of ourselves, we get to explore when we're sober and really embrace. And um, not there's no shame there. There's no like embarrassment about liking Star Wars or whatever that thing is. That's who you are. Mm -hmm. And I think you just become more confident too as... You have um, sobriety longer. Yes, yes. You know, I, 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 I don't. I'm surprised that I didn't think about this until you really triggered for me, triggered in a good way, not in a bad way, about the curiosity and being like a 14 year old. Like, so I went. I, I, I was telling you earlier. I went camping and fly fishing out in the Texas salt water. Mars saw beautiful birds. There's a bird, there's a lot of birds because it's winter time, so they 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 nest here basically. They, mm. I guess they come up from the south. I don't I don't know where they come from, but there's a lot of birds in the Gulf of Mexico uh, that are not always here, and they and they and they nest in these islands. Anyway, my point is, if I was drinking alcohol, I probably would have. Boat, a beer on my on my kayak, and I'd pull over and be like, "Oh, I'm gonna look at this. Have a few beers." Like my mind, it's so it's so the alcohol is so it takes up headspace, just like the smartphone does, mm -hmm. and and they're so connected. Where when they're not there, I have time to. I'm looking. I just look at things. I'm just yeah. I'm just like, wow, what's what is that? What like experiencing the world is an amazing. I mean, it. I don't know. I, I sound like a I probably sound like a goopball, but it's just it, 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 it's when that stuff leaves your brain. Your brain, ha you, 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 our brain is so capable of creative thought and thinking and feeling connected to people and 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 just the p things around us and uh, to a higher self, basically as corny as that is. To uh, exactly. and and I think you really were just highlighting that and it just made me think like I'm like yeah, that's exactly how I feel like that mm -hmm. curiosity thing. There, there's, there's a gentleman. I'm sure. Do you know, do you know Stephen Pressfield? Turning oh pro? yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. Well, um, didn't he write the war, war of Art or something? The war, the War of Art was the one before this, and okay. I've got all of his stuff. Uh, he's a great author. Uh, his memoir just came out. As a matter of fact, I might, I might uh, uh, send you a copy of that. I love that book. Oh, cool. Anyway, he talks about it here and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap with this uh, and that is that we we and he going back to this 14 he, that's what triggered that thought is that when we're younger we have aspirations of a higher self of a calling if you will um, whether it be to art or writing or e or even service or servicing our community or just being a good mother or a good father uh, or a good human whatever whatever that calling might be there's something aspirational that 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 is there and and his point would be we take a step towards that aspiration and it's hard it's hard we realize I really want this this is who I should be mm -hmm. and then it's like there's the grind of the work and yeah. that's where the in, that's and at that moment in our weakness of that grind is where where addictive substances can, can enter our world whether it's alcohol or drugs or or gambling or, or just take take your vice right mm -hmm. and and that and that that uh, addiction takes the place or clouds that aspiration. So then we become we become dissatisfied, if you will, because we're not reaching our aspirational self because of now we have this addictive substance that or, or, or behavior that we're now doing, and it feeds on itself. So now we're unhappy because we're not reaching our potential, and so we turn back to the substance, and that's what creates this the downward spiral or the elevator as I rec it was was pointing out but there's a downward mm -hmm. spiral of life versus an upward aspirational cycle of life and um, and he and he just points out that that you've got to get rid of the addiction uh, whether it be alcohol drugs uh, he even mentions love some people are just addicted to, to oh. drama and loving other people or, or, or what, whatever the case is I mean there's a whole mm -hmm. list of things right but it, it's basically a substitute for that aspirational self and I think that's what you and I have been alluding to like what's the benefit the benefit is that you, you strip that away and you actually uh, do hard things you pick up that paintbrush you write mm -hmm. those words you, 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 you make a sales call you you, you you just do the thing, 
and and you're like, wow, that was hard, but there's benefit there. Yeah. And and uh, and when you have when you have those addictive type of things in your life, they steal those moments from us, and they make it exactly. harder. Exactly. Mm-hmm. That's that's the whole. When when he when I read that, and I just spent seven minutes explaining something that he literally wrote in three paragraphs. I could have read it to you shorter. <laughs> But it wouldn't you know have your flair or your flavor. So, well, you know, he he, he is an amazing writer because he's so succinct. But I was like, that's it, that's mm-hmm. it, and 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 so we re- we he in his words we substitute aspiration with addiction. So we think it, it we don't we don't realize that's what we're doing in the moment. But we're like, oh, that's hard, mm-hmm. and so I'll do this, and it's easier. I'll drink a beer, and it makes me feel good. You know, mm-hmm. doing hard work makes you feel good. You know, yeah. it's like the uh, the success of running a marathon. Mm-hmm. Uh, is is I'm, this is me overlaying this on top? Running the marathon in the moment sucks, but you know what? Hitting that finish line is like hell yeah, I finished it, the, and then yeah. you're happy, right? It's like the remembering of the happiness. So you you transpose all of those good feelings across all of that suckiness, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Yep. You finish yeah. that painting back there, that amazing. Uh, beautiful artwork that you have right behind you. Probably all those minutes of actually brushed to the to the paint and figuring that out. Probably there's a lot of suck in there, right? Yeah, because you're. you're, I mean, you're like, there you go. go. Then you're like, it's amazing. I did it. I finished. I was able to do it. That's right. And I I think the other thing too is once you um, jump the hurdle of sobriety or losing weight or whatever, it also bolsters you to do other hard things because yes. you did this one really hard thing. They just, yes. again, same thing, compound effect. It all builds on itself. I love it. I love it. Anything you want to say, Paige, before we wrap this up? I've got a little closing remark, and then uh, I was going to let you go. We'll, we'll, uh, I'm going to yield the floor to you. Well, I just want to thank you for inviting me to come chat with you. It's always a joy. So thank you. And uh, those of you who are watching this, who are questioning whether you can, you can. You got this. You got this. Thank you so much for watching. If you've made it this far, I'm going to put a link. I have an email list that I'm working on a free guide Uh, just to kind of summarize how you can start your alcohol-free journey, especially if you're over 50 years old like I am. Uh, I want you to 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 just view life as, as you've got a whole nother round, another 50 years at it, and there's some aspirations and some giving back to your community that you could be doing, and I want to help you. Thank you so much for taking the time. Let me know if I can be of help to you, and I look forward to seeing you again.